everyone, my name is Nicola Nova. I'm an associate professor at the Geneva School of Art and Design here in Geneva, and I'm also an uh, associate and uh, co-founder of the Near Future Laboratory, a design fiction consultancy based in Europe and in the US. The topic of my talk uh, today is about digital rubbish, digital trash, all those kind of junk electronics we all have, and, and how it can play a role in the, in the future. Uh, my perspective here is that I'm, I'm an anthropologist, basically, uh, uh, studying people's culture, people's practices, operating in a design school, uh, obviously, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in giving you some kind of overview of this project, why I became interested in digital rubbish, uh, what role it can play uh, in uh, society, and of course the problems related to, uh, to this. And obviously what I try to, to show you is the importance of reusing. I guess you're convinced about that, but I'm, I'm interested in more amateur practices about recycling and reusing as opposed to more industrialized uh, perspective. So to get things started, I guess you're all familiar with this kind of, uh, of problems. I mean, human beings produce a lot of trash and rubbish. I mean, I guess if you have a, a laptop, it's very likely that you had a like, laptop in the past, even though you want to continue using them for, uh, for a while. The situation happens at the more general level that we produce tons of like those electronic uh, kind of trash. And that's a big problem because of course the resources uh, that are used to create those devices and the energy uh, it takes is very uh, problematic for, for the planet. I mean, this is what you see here in the picture is probably something that you only see in certain kind of professional contexts. But if you look at people's places, like if you spend uh, some time like I do uh, doing like studying how people use technology, you would find things like that, like, like this person having this kind of stack of former uh, iPhones uh, uh, put in their, in their, uh, on their shelves. That's a very common situation. So that's the most common observation, I guess, I made uh, in a decade of observation of smartphone uh, usage. And one of the main reasons for this is that, I mean, even though uh, the object are uh, obsolescence, uh, one of the main reasons for this is, of course, that people are not really sure about to, how to use them, how to recycle them and sometimes they want to keep them because there might be a picture or a video or uh, some music that they want to uh, access and they keep it and I think this is a very intriguing uh, situation that we need to, uh, to to focus on as a society uh, and it's not I mean it's not just smartphones if you look at like people's uh, shelves you would find like video game consoles old computers uh, old uh, uh, iPads or Walkmans or old electronic uh, devices. And that's, I mean, it's, 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 it's very intriguing or very shocking, stumbling to, to, to realize that there's a lot of sort of defunct or semi-defunct electronics that sit in people's home and are not necessarily used anymore, but still people keep them. Uh, in general, when we talk about those issues, the, the, I mean, when we talk about digital rubbish, there's always this tendency to focus on recycling. I mean, and, and the fact that there are specific uh, supply chains and circuits so that people can uh, recycle their uh, electronics. And of course, that exists. Uh, I think I saw that one in, in Montreal a few, uh, few years ago. And that's, that's interesting that that exists. But the problem with this, and, and that's a very common uh, issue of recycling is that we're not exactly sure what happened after we put the object in this box. Where would it go? Where does it go? Is it sold by someone uh, here, for instance, in Montreal, or is it shipped on the other side of the planet, or is it just uh, put in a landfill somewhere? So that's kind of uh, problematic because we're not we're not sure about whether it's properly recycled, and if if it does, what happens? I mean, there's some kind of black box and opacity here that that exists. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in different perspective. I don't want to neglect like the recycling uh, option, like the industrial recycling system, but I'm more intrigued by uh, like amateur or like practices around reusing and recycling that happens at the uh, more human level. 
I mean, I've, uh, I've done a, a project recently with my colleague Anais Block. In the last three years, we uh, focused on smartphone repairers, the repair shops that helps you to well, repair, broke, fix your broken screen, a button, the memory of your uh, smartphone. And we were interested in many things about that. But one of the angles that I found the most exciting of was the way those places are a way to, to learn how to take care of objects and how in doing so, in, in repairing and maintaining uh, smartphones, uh, a lot of like components or elements from former smartphones are reused in this, uh, in this context. And it's uh, basically a more uh, human practice. I, I, I said amateur practice, I'm not sure it's the right term because of course they're professionals, but they're professionals who had to learn how to repair those devices without uh, a collaboration with big industrial companies. They learn that by themselves. And that's, uh, I think, what is interesting in the context of recycling and reusing is this notion that, that people can, like, like repairers, like, like some, some amateurs in hackerspaces and fab labs, can learn by themselves how to reuse former devices to uh, make other uh, electronic devices last longer. And that is, of course, uh, an important challenge uh, these days. Uh, you can see here the guys fixing a Nokia uh, 3210, like old device, but still it can uh, fix the battery of the, of the, of the device. So basically what, what I want to do in this, in this short talk is to, uh, to, give, to give you some kind of overall perspective of a, a whole range of practices that I find interesting regarding reusing and recycling that happens at the more uh, like grassroots or human level. It's not industrial practice. It's more like group humans or group of humans trying to, uh, well, basically recycle and reuse uh, digital rubbish in a way that I find stimulating. And I try at the end of the, the short presentation to, to tell you why it's, it's important and what it means in terms of re reclaiming uh, futures, which is the topic of this conference. So uh, a common, a common uh, practice with regards to digital junk is uh, having people buying or finding former uh, devices, like in this case, a Commodore 64. Like it's, a, it's a computer from the 80s, and it's quite famous in uh, uh, music communities because of this sound proce processor. So a lot of people try to find them and, well, reuse the Commodore 64 or uh, uh, pulling pull it apart so that they can ex extract this sound processor and use it uh, for for something else. I mean, as you can see from the tweet, it's not uncommon. It's quite a, 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 a practice that is commonly done by uh, by some uh, electronic uh, musicians. And I've been uh, in the last uh, probably five or six years, I've been quite intrigued by this kind of practice. And as you can see here with this very strange kind of device, uh, it leads to reusing like the sound processor of Commodore 64 leads to strange objects. Here you have a SID chip synth. SID is the name of the sound processor of the Commodore 64. And here you have a music label in Leipzig in Germany, who's, uh, which is focused on a, 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 a sort of weird music genre called 8-beat reggae, which means making reggae music, reggae and dub music with 8-beat like old uh, computers from the from the 80s with a specific kind of processor. And what they do, uh, like they produce music and musicians, but they also create those very strange looking machines, which are basically a, a, a Commodore 64 shell with two uh, music synthesizers that have a, a Commodore 64, two Commodore 64 uh, microchips sound processors in there. So what is interesting here is you have some kind of hybrid between a machine from the past and its sound processor and a machine and machines from today, some kind of mix of low tech, high tech uh, technology. It's not sold, they don't sell it. They can help you uh, making one. And sometimes they can ask you for uh, uh, small, a small amount of money for, for, for that. But it's interesting to, to find this example as sort of like totally under the, the commercial radar. It's, it's not a very, very common, but still it's an interesting uh, example and practice. And it's, of course, this is not 
uh, this kind of practice of mixing old technologies with new technologies is not uh, is not new. I mean, you have countries like Cuba, for instance, uh, they have a whole information system that relies on a mix of uh, different technologies because of the embargo, because of the economic problems they have, but still they manage to find ways to have uh, information technologies. And, and here it's just a picture of a of a, a, a of a machine I saw uh, in um, at the bus station at the at the office and 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 behind that you had like a series of computers uh, there were like common uh, computers from uh, PCs from the the mid nineties PCs from the year two thousand working all together and what I find in interesting is that uh, they I mean they managed to have an information system which such. Uh, 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 a various a multiplicity of uh, of artifacts. So that's I mean I don't want to point like this Cuba as a, as an exotic exotic system. What I want to mean here is that what happens in Cuba is I mean can happens more generally with information system made of different kinds of, of, of computers with sound processors from one computer and uh, a, a, a more recent uh, machine and what happened in Cuba might be more <laughs> generalized in the in the future is it a good thing is it a bad thing that's not uh, for me to say at this point but as we'll see in the conclusion it's certainly uh, relevant when finding solutions about how we can care for our technologies what does it mean more generally? Uh, thinking about recycling or reusing technologies, information technologies. I mean, there are many practices about that. I mean, if you look at designers like Forma Fantasma, you would find those uh, strange looking kind of uh, furniture, like chairs and tables made with uh, uh, old electronic devices. Some are recent, some are not recent, but this group of designer uh, industrial designer is interested in making products out of former uh, technologies. Is that good? Is that bad? I'm not entirely sure. But I'm, what I find interesting here is that they treat information technology as a material and turn it into something else so that the object itself can last longer. Of course, here it's not necessarily working as a computer, but it's a way to reuse it. Probably a bit tongue-in-cheek, but still interesting. Uh, another example, and I guess if you saw uh, uh, the talk uh, by Benjamin Golon, you uh, would totally understand what I, what I mean here. Uh, it's what, what artists like Benjamin uh, and Jérôme Sinclair do with the Internet of Dead Things Institute. Uh, I think it's a very stimulating example, their Internet of Dead Things Institute, a very stimulating example to realize that information technologies of the past can be, I mean, adjusted, reused, transformed, recycled to first to make us aware. That's the probably one, one uh, objective to make us aware that this object can last longer and can be still valuable. But it can be also interesting as a, as a solution for uh, having a computer to reuse technologies of the past and probably tune them, adjust them in a way that is relevant today. So in their uh, Internet of Dead Things Institute, the way they used the Minitel, this uh, French uh, information technology from the 80s and 90s, the way they use it and reuse it and turn this machine into some kind of gaming uh, system is, is, is very interesting uh, as a way to, well, show us uh, how technologies of the past can be revived, can be uh, transformed and certainly play a role in the near future. And this is also interesting because the way uh, Benjamin Golon and Jérôme Sinclair works in this uh, context, it's a, it, 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 the way they worked about it is based on the notion of critical recycling. The fact that recycling, reusing a certain technology by understanding how it works, how it doesn't work for certain things and how it can, how it can be adjusted is relevant as a way to have a critical perspective on the technology and probably domesticate it and repurpose it for one's own uh, purposes. Another example, probably one of the last, is uh, this, this kind of like uh, music and video game scenes that still exist uh, nowadays, uh, mostly in Scandinavia, uh, but a bit elsewhere in Europe uh, as well, in, in, uh, in Japan, in the US, is uh, groups of people interested in developing video games on old computers. 
It's not necessarily nostalgia or retro gaming because it's often done by people who were not there at the time. Uh, here you have a, a, a cartridge, a video game and music cartridge that you can put on a Commodore 64. It's a computer that existed in the mid 80s. And I do find it interesting to have people creating games and creating those like objects. You have to plug this object in a Commodore 64. The fact that they do this nowadays in 20, uh, 20, uh, 10 or 20, probably they've done this project, it was 2019 or 18. I do find it a bit interesting because it shows that it's some kind of like parallel system of progress because the game you have here could not be, could not exist conceptually at the time. I mean, it, it could be programmed at the time, but conceptually the logic, the mechanic that was nurtured by the whole, I mean, the whole imaginary that exists in the year 2000 and, and, and beyond. And the fact that it's done on a machine of the past, but it pushes somehow the uh, boundaries and the envelope of what a video game is and, and was makes it new. I mean, it's a, a game from, from last year or two years ago. So it means that it's not from the distant past. But still, it's for a machine that existed in like like 30 years ago. So there's something intriguing, some kind of tension between a technology of the past and a content of uh, of today. And probably this whole, uh, the way I frame it here, technology of the past and technology of today is wrong. It means that there's, a, a, there's always been a, 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 some kind of, uh, some, some kind of parallel perspective about progress that is not about bringing uh, constantly something new technologically uh, speaking. You can reinvent things from the past and it would be new and original. And we can label that probably progress because it's about caring about the planet, not about always reinventing uh, crap so that we put that in the landfill afterwards. And this, I mean, this, this all those like, like, kind of practices related to uh, reusing, transforming uh, old objects is it's important because if you think about the history of uh, bricolage and do-it-yourself practices, uh, very complex technologies of today, like electronic music instruments, uh, radio uh, machines, they used, to be, uh, they used to be described as something you can do, you can build by yourself. I found this book on the flea, flea market called uh, 15 Post, uh, Modern Post uh, Agelen, which is like a, a mineral that you can use to create radio, uh, 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 FM radio uh, system. Uh, and I, I, I mean, in the past, in the, in the 60s, you could buy books that would tell you the things you would have to buy, uh, pieces of strings, certain kind of electronics you can buy here and there to build your own radio. And, and this, of course, I mean, can you imagine uh, uh, today having like a, a book that tells you 15 ways to build your own computer? Of course, it would be difficult to do it from scratch, but by reusing former PCs from old electronics, it, uh, it can be done. And of course, it's done in the context of electronic music. For instance, this book by Nicholas Collins called Handmade Electronic Music is a good example about that helps you to create your own handmade electronic device. So the equivalent with digital technologies uh, sort of exists in certain communities, but still we're a long way uh, to, uh, to, to this. But it would be, it would be I do find it, this case is stimulating to think about what it means to well, reinvent uh, a computer today based on technologies of the, of the past. And of course that exists in the hackers community. If you go to Hackaday or uh, some, some websites about hacking uh, communities, you would find uh, people telling you how to reuse your old laptop with uh, a Raspberry Pi uh, system and, and, and how to, I mean, not necessarily repair, but recycle former electronics to make your uh, uh, smartphones or your laptop uh, or your video game console work uh, again. And that, I think, is, uh, uh, well, it's going to be happening more uh, frequently in the future. And there's a need to uh, understand what happens here. And there's a need to probably uh, guide people to uh, adopt those uh, practices. So what? I mean, quick, quick conclusion here. Uh, one, one point that I wanted to make here is that um, I think this topic is quite important because in general, what, when, we, when we think about 
uh, like the environmental collapse and uh, like the damage we do on this planet. Information technologies are seen as the last kind of problems we do have a uh, thing to focus on before, like uh, such as food, caring uh, for others, social justice, uh, not destroying uh, the biodiversity. But I mean, it, it's, it, it's not, I mean, the, those uh, challenges does not, do not necessarily mean that we have to get rid of information technologies, uh, mostly because they are here already. Uh, we, we can probably use them also for uh, public good, they could be relevant, but of course the conditions for this is to get out of this kind of crazy consumption cycles that make technology obsolescent and then uh, we have to change like uh, uh, electronics every, every year or every two years. So I, I do think it's interesting to uh, try to address this kind of paradox between the ecological uh, crisis and this notion that information technologies uh, can be can be uh, well could be useful and could be uh, relevant, and in the context of uh, uh, an article I wrote with Gauthier aussi, who uh, gave a talk here uh, as well, we tried to come up with this notion of situated digital technologies as a way to show that the framing between low tech. Uh, digital or high-tech digital is probably a bit too simplistic and what matters is thinking about how digital technologies that exist nowadays can be more situated uh, from an energy perspective, from a material perspective and one of the ways it could be situated in a material perspective is by strengthening the reuse and the recycle of past technologies and not developing uh, constantly new uh, devices, new smartphones, new laptops. Probably there's enough already on this planet to reshuffle, reuse, transform, adjust, so that it could be uh, relevant for, for, for us. Um, and of course, uh, this, I mean, what, what I've presented here is important, not just about the object themselves. Of course, it's important to uh, uh, reuse and recycle object. It will create new kind of artifacts based on the artifacts from the past, but it's also important. The, all the practices I've described before are important because it uh, it focused on creating know-hows, knowledge, documents, skills by trying to readapt technologies of the past, like I showed, and turn them into technologies of tomorrow. We learn things, we do things together that, uh, well help us reappropriate technologies and do not leave this uh, technologies to the big to the big companies it helps generating in general with open source uh, format ways of uh, re reusing ways of documenting and better use uh, those uh, technologies uh, so if you're interested in all, all of this there's a whole field in information technology in digital cultures that address those issues it's called collapse informatics as you can see from this uh, paper, Collapse Informatics, is the study, the design, and the development of social technical system in the abundant present, today, uh, for use in a future of scarcity. And what I've presented here, I mean, all the practices I've presented, I do think that could be, they could be relevant in a future of scarcity in terms of problems with energy, with material, with uh, limits on this planet. We are in a time of abundant use these days, so it's time probably to think about how reusing electronics uh, can be probably more sustainable and more uh, relevant for, for this planet. And there's a whole field that goes beyond recycling that focuses on this, and it's called collapse informatics. So I would I think to, to, to conclude the talk, I think I will uh, stop here and probably leave you with this, this, this question that I'm, I'm interested in and we can probably discuss afterwards is what roles those practices can play in building more habitable near future worlds? What does it mean to take all those cases, those kind of signals uh, of technological usage and reusage uh, to think about how technology should be tomorrow? Does it mean that we have to stop using technology? Does it mean that we can be inspired by these practices to make things, such technologies, last longer? Is it relevant to still play video games in the context of an ecological crisis? Is it important to have like communication systems that works over the distance, like a smartphone? I'm not sure about that, but I'm but I'm interested in the fact that those technologies are here already, and I mean. 
we can probably uh, still uh, use them in, in a way, or we can trash them, but that would be bad for the planet as well. So it's just a way, I mean, to conclude by saying that we have those things that we don't necessarily know what to do, but still, as uh, participants in reclaiming futures, we need to consider those things. Otherwise, they would be just sitting around uh, as uh, digital rubbish. Thank you very much for your uh, attention.